This indeed was a horrific, horrific week. I um, mean, as Pastor Bill uh, mentioned earlier about the cruel murders, killing, slaughtering of nine people. Just an incredible uh, week. The kind of pain that has been created now because of the the actions of one one uh, one man who hates African Americans. Sad day in our nation. Uh, yeah, our nation um, has made tremendous progress in the area of race and race relations, and it seems as though sometimes that we make three steps forward and four backward sometimes. Um, so yeah, we're we're not we're not home yet, beloved. We are still in the earth, and though we're saddened, we are dismayed, we are shocked, even stunned. But we should not we should not be surprised at the level of evil that can be perpetrated by any any one or any group of individuals. The capacity for evil is in all of us. And and I know, you know, we would like to think that we would never do anything like that. And the only safeguard we have is being in Jesus Christ. And I say safeguard. Being in Christ and walking in Christ is the only hope for mankind. And apart from the Lord Jesus, there is no hope. So until until men are redeemed and until men know their own brokenness, the racism that exists in their hearts, the evil, the hatred of other people that exist, will sit there like a seething pot, a cauldron, just boiling up and looking for an opportunity to express itself. And what we don't want to do now, we don't want to react to the hatred. And these kinds of events, incredible, because they they bring about, um, in one sense, a real time where you and I really do need to take an evaluation of who we are and why we're here. Some of the questions that come up in these kinds of situations are, why do good people suffer? I mean, why there? In a Bible study. Why there? I, I don't pretend. I, I don't even want to act as if I have any answers. I don't. I don't. That That's what evil does. Evil, this kind of evil creates questions that are inexplicable. Beyond, beyond our ability to really explain in a reasonable way. Many will even question God. Why would God permit this? How could God allow it? And yet this isn't the first time that people have been slaughtered or killed. And this has been going on for for ages, millennium. Thousands upon thousands of years, men have been slaughtering and killing innocent people. It's not new. Um, And yes, God does permit evil. He permitted evil to enter the world. And ultimately, he's going to demonstrate that through evil, he's going to demonstrate his own glory, his own authority, his own supremacy. Another issue that comes up is is this idea of immunity that you and I as believers, I think you and I, we, we trust in God's mercy and favor. But there are no guarantees, and it doesn't mean we're immune to 
tragic accidents or deliberate acts of terror or deliberate acts of evil doesn't mean we're we're immune. We do trust God that regardless of what, as Job said, that um, whether I live or die, I mean, I'm, I'm his. Paul said, or rather, that whether I live or die, I am the Lord's. That um, regardless, and, and many, many a saint has died for their faith. Amen. And many will continue to die for their faith. And why, why, in a, why in a church, of all places? You would think in a church, it, we'd be safe. <laughs> One, it, supposedly, we assume that the church is, is the citadel of, of, of security, at least represents for the African Americans, it has been our fortress, our place, where we've identified our sense of strength as a community. And we thank God for the church. And for what it has stood for in the African-American community. And in fact, that supposedly is one of the reasons why he targeted that church. Because that church has made, has a historic historic uh, record in terms of its, its civil rights and um, concerns and its movement way back in um, hundreds of years ago. Part of the um, Underground Railroad system. And perhaps, yes, he wanted to make a statement. And he has. He's made a statement. But uh, with evil, with evil, you and I don't be deceived. In fact, our enemy is not flesh and blood. Our enemy is not the roofs of the world. Men that hate our flesh, our, our body, our, our, the color of our skin. They are not our real enemy. The real enemy of our soul is Satan. And we can we can miss that and focus so heavily upon the the man that committed this treacherous um, act against African-Americans and miss the fact that it's it's really the devil. Um, And I don't want to sound overly simplistic, but it is just as Bill said earlier, Pastor Benson said that he seeks to kill to steal, and to destroy. So how does the church respond? How does the church respond to this? Do do we get uh, metal detectors and put put on our doors? Do do we put up more bars? uh, What what do we do? What do we do? Do we hire um, security gun-toting security men. Some churches do. But uh, I I think the church, if we're going to be effective, we always have to be perceived. And it does make us vulnerable. I'm, I'm without question. We are vulnerable. But we cannot, we cannot, in the name of our, our own security, protect ourselves from the world that he has called us to reach. We cannot do that. We can't put up steel windows or, you know, or whatever. I, I don't know, to protect ourselves from the world. We, we have to, yes, continue to be accessible to this world. That's what I'm getting at. And the reality is, is that all of us are vulnerable. You're vulnerable on the street. You're driving. You're vulnerable in the malls. You're vulnerable in the movies. You're vulnerable in your home. You're vulnerable walking down the street. You're vulnerable. You're vulnerable. We just are. There's no escaping that. And, and so events like this remind us again and again of just how um, tenuous life is. And in an instant, it can change. Yes. We, we, we got up this morning. It might be that some of us may not make it home tonight. We don't know. That's why James says, when, when you make plans, you better include God in your plans. James says, if the Lord wills, we'll go, we'll do that. And stop this haughty thinking that, that you got it all. No, you don't. No, you don't. Except the Lord. 
be the keeper of the house, we labor in vain. Except he be the guardian, laboring in vain. So your best protection isn't isn't a uh, an alarm system on your house. Your best security is the Lord. I don't know if I, I can say this because I'm in in the church of the living God. I don't know how many times I've left my door open and unlocked. Got up the next morning and thought somebody broke in. No, silly. I left it. <laughs> left left the garage door. I mean, the garage door up. Got up the next morning. Really? Did, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I slept like a baby. Didn't know it. But all the while, it just reminded me, just reminded me what? It's God yeah. who ke- he's the keeper. Yeah. He's the shade on my right side. Yeah. Uh, our security is in Jesus Christ. But as a church, what do we what do we want to do? And I, I do want to say, humanly speaking, from from a human standpoint, we're going to do everything we can within reason. To secure, to make sure that we are as safe as humanly possible here in in man of Bible. And frankly, um, when, when you're looking at when we were looking at what happened in, in Charleston, there were nine people. In the prayer service and, and Bible study. Now I don't know how large their, their uh, church is, but nine people on a Wednesday night in prayer. I'm I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. I, I'm wondering if if more people were at prayer, would he have done that? I'm just wondering if more men were there, would he have felt as free? I'm just just throwing it out there. Nine people in a in a prayer service. Usually here at Mana we have somewhere near 20, 25, sometimes as many as 30. But the ratio is about the same. Of the nine people, there were six women, three men. And the ratio is about the same. Every every night, every Wednesday night. There are more women gathered together in prayer than there are men. In fact, sometimes there are only two or three that are gathered for prayer in Manor Bible Baptist Church. This this is just the the state of, of things in the church. And I think I think what happened, it it really ought to cause all of us, every church, every leader, to really take take a look. One of the things I'm, I'm taking a look at is this idea of, of of men and the significance of men in the economy of God, in, in what God is doing. If you want to know, if you want to know what God is doing in the world, look at the church. God is working through the church. And if you want to know who the primary leaders are in the church, look for men. That's who God wants to be leading in the church. And that's men. And if you take if you take a a poll on a Wednesday, for instance, and try to measure the 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 strength of the leadership then it would indicate, for instance, that Man of Bible is, is very weak in terms of its leadership. Why? Because of the absence of men. There's this passage I want to draw your attention to, and I think it has a lot to say relative to these uh, comments that I'm making. Here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the writer is Moses. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to tend and to keep it. I'm reading verse 15, chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man whom he had created from the dust of the ground and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying to him, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper who is fit for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. And the man said, or rather Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall be one flesh. Scripture says here, the Lord God took the man after creating Adam out of the ground. He put him in a garden called the Garden of Eden. And the purpose for putting Adam in the garden, as the text says, was to tend and to keep it. The word to tend means to perpetually cultivate Not like not like me. I've, I've got weeds and I, I just get tired, just get tired of running after weeds. Go out into the garden. They're there. Pull them up. Two weeks later, after a nice rain, more weeds. I just get tired. So I, I bought I bought this. Uh, Roundup. I'm 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 killing them now. And and the past couple of days I, I shot Roundup on him and, and I was afraid because the rain was coming and I was afraid the rain was gonna wash it all away. So I've been going out there every day checking. And sure enough, those things are drying up. But I, I just get tired. But but here in the text, God God puts Adam in the garden. To perpetually cult to be to be forever digging in the dirt to what to make it capable of producing plants to perpetuate what plant growth and life why because he was going to be eating off those plants so in order to eat and survive he had to take care to tend it had to cultivate it he had to cause the dirt to increase its capacity for producing life-giving plants. He said to tend and to keep it. The word keep there is to guard, to watch it. See, that's what I did. I I went out a couple of mornings just to look, stood over, just just seeing if, if any, did I miss any? To guard it, to protect it. To make sure that the garden would be able to fully reach its its, uh, full capacity. And so a man is responsible for his Eden to do what? To tend it perpetually and to guard it protectively. Our gardens, our gardens are. Metaphorically, our homes, men are responsible, fathers are responsible for their homes, for what? Tending it, for guarding it against predators, against evil that can encroach into the home, whether it be evil ideas or evil people. Men are responsible for tending and guarding their homes. Men are responsible for creating an environment that will lend itself to healthy growth in their homes and in church. 
And that's the responsibility Adam had. And in light of this responsibility, there are, what I, what I would suggest to you, are some inescapable conclusions that we get from, from Scripture. And one of those, when, when you're reading the Scripture, it's impossible to miss this. And if you miss this, then you haven't really read the Word of God. But one, one of the things that stands out in the Scripture, the inescapable uh, reality is, is that Jesus Christ is the eternal God. And that essentially, as the God-man, what he wants to do is to tend and keep his church. What does he want to do? He wants to guard, protect the church, his body, his bride, so that it can perpetually reproduce itself. It's inescapable that Jesus Christ is the living God. And yet he died as a man to save us. That's inescapable when you read the scripture. It's inescapable that you and I will one day stand before him and give an account to, to the living God in the person of Jesus Christ. You can't read scripture and miss that. And if you do miss it, then you haven't really read the scripture. And there are a lot of people who miss the authority and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Simply because they haven't really read. But there's, there's another. There's some other subplots or sub-themes that, that come through the scripture. And, and another one is, that very pertinent to our discussion this morning, is that, and, 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 and frankly, it, it permeates Virtually every page of scripture, every book of scripture that God primarily wants to use men. You, you can't read the scripture and miss that. If you miss it, then you haven't read it. Kings, God used. Warriors, God used. God raised up men in the nation of Israel to guard and to tend, to protect, to sustain the life of the nation of Israel. So men, men are significant in the scheme of God. When God put the man in the garden, it was his full intention to make man responsible and accountable to him for the condition of the garden. Hence, when sin entered the world, God asked for Adam. He did not ask for Eve. Did he ignore Eve? No, but he asked for Adam because Adam, the man, was the one who was responsible. And so... It's, it's inescapable, this idea of man's responsibility and his authority to lead both in the home and in the church. And God does not, I'm not saying that women don't have a place in God's plans. Absolutely. The scripture says that he took a rib from the man and made the woman. So what is the role of the woman, generally speaking, to support the man in his leadership? The woman's sin in the garden was that she became an assertive pursuer who chose to lead Adam. She brought the fruit that God said don't eat. She brought it to the man. In doing so, she's taking leadership responsibility. She asserted herself in an area where she shouldn't have been. That was the woman's sin. The man's sin was that he became a passive responder who chose to follow. God made him to lead, not to follow. And I, I would suggest to you that the condition of the garden was corrupted because of the woman's sin and the man's sin. Her assertiveness, his passivity 
And I would suggest to you that the same exists today in God's garden. That uh, women will tend to assert themselves. And I didn't expect a woman in this place to say amen to that. <laughs> amen, she said. <laughs> and, and sometimes the, the, assertive, the, the woman asserting herself sometimes is in response to the man being passive. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. Enough, enough, enough. All right. <laughs> oh, my. But but the 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 ultimate responsibility is is Adams the man that even even if the woman asserts herself the responsibility of the man is to take the lead and not be a passive responder well in in doing so it corrupted the garden and and read if you haven't read Genesis three and you'll see uh, the the garden was corrupted as a result of misplaced priorities, as a result of reversal of roles. The woman takes the lead, the man follows. And hence, I, I want to um, suggest this, um, a few things. And this idea that um, of, of men leading I want to um, suggest that men, we're responsible for shaping, with, particularly with our children, we're responsible for shaping their worldview, how they view, how they think about the world. We're responsible for that. I love what Thomas Sowell, Thomas Sowell is an African-American economist, and he, he says this when, when, he's, when we're talking about a worldview. A worldview is this idea of how we look at the world. And everybody has a worldview. Every one of us. Some of us have a worldview that doesn't have Christ in the center of it. Some of us have developed a worldview. We look at the world. We try to we try to do a, 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 a combination of both what the Bible says, but also what the world says. We try to kind of mix it up. And come up with our own customized view of what the world is really all about. Well, this idea of worldview is about our thinking relative to what reality. What is reality? What, what, is, what is really true? What, what is the reality? And, and that's, that's where we, we develop our worldview. We try to explain reality by way of our understanding. And, and I love what Thomas Sowell said in, in, in his book. He, he called it, he called it what he, he said, it's the silent shapers of our thoughts. That there are these voices, ideas that are in the back of our mind that shape our, our thoughts. And you got to ask yourself, well, where did those thoughts come from? Those silent voices, those silent shapers of our thoughts. And see what, what God wants, particularly for men, is to be shapers of those thoughts for children. So that we hedge our children in because we've, we've, we've catechized them, we, we've drilled, we've, we've taught them, we, we've, we've influenced their thinking. The Bible says, commit your works unto the Lord and your thoughts will be established. When you choose to follow God, God, those thoughts, the right thoughts will follow you. This, this idea of men, uh, we, we are shapers, we're shapers of, of our, our children's mind. And so we want to make sure that we're telling the story, we want to be consistent in our, our telling of the story. Um, so as, as a shaper, what, what we do, we want to make sure that we're advancing this, this narrative of scripture. And the narrative of the scripture is it runs along what I would suggest are, are these four ideas that shape have to shape our, our view of the world. 
These four ideas is, is one, what we just read, that God created the man and put him in the garden. That's, that's the first. So we want to develop our thinking relative to the creation. That God is creator. He made us, what, for his glory. He, he has a purpose for our existence. Second, the fall. We explain the world through the lens, through the worldview of God being creator and also of the fall that man has fallen into sin. How else do you explain a, a, a young man walking into a church and killing nine people? How do you explain that? Some of the some of the uh, evolutionists and Darwinian uh, thinkers, their worldview, they seem to think man is getting better. Take a look. Take a look. Are we getting better? No, no, beloved. See, we can explain the world and anything that happens in the world. We can explain it by way of what? The fall when it comes to man. And we can explain the world. We look at the world also through the eye of redemption. So we're looking at the creation. We're looking at the fall. We're looking at the redemption. That man has fallen into sin and God sends his son, Jesus Christ, into his garden. To tend it, to keep it, to fix it, as it were, because man has fallen into sin. So he wants to redeem us. And how does God redeem us? God takes on humanity in the person of Jesus Christ and dies for our sin. So he redeems us from our sin. But then the fourth stage of, of this narrative is the idea of glorification. That one day, this world is going to be transformed and glorified beyond your ability to imagine. And we're not there yet. Clearly, we're not there yet. But these are the four ideas that are so permeate the scripture so clearly permeate the scripture and you and I as men need to be what need to be shapers of the minds of our of our children along this track the creator the fall the redemption and the glorification that things are going to culminate one day at the throne of Jesus Christ we are mind shapers I remember, I remember um, growing up with with my dad, and um, when I, I don't know what age I was, but he would take us out on. He was a truck driver, and he would take us out to his different stops, and I, I was just, I was just overwhelmed with so much joy just to be in the truck with him and to hear the rev of the motor. Him shifting gears and oh man, it made such an impact on me. I got to a point in life where all I wanted to be was a tractor trailer driver. I still have yet to drive a tractor trailer. <laughs> but I, I can't tell you, man, every time I'm driving down the road and I see these big rigs coming up, man, I'm in admiration of those guys sitting up high. Man, it's just and, and all because my, my presence with my dad, he shaped my my thinking. I remember I remember um, he, he also was our coach, a baseball coach. He was our baseball coach. And and um, I again, just so impressed with my dad. Um, on, on, on this team. Um, I remember one time uh, we were losing. We were losing. And <laughs> the bases were loaded. We were down by three. It's the ninth inning. And it was my turn to bat. I don't know why you're laughing. You must have been there. It was my turn to bat. And, and uh, the whole idea, is now, now we're already losing. Ninth inning. 
And here's my, my turn. And, and, and he looks at me. And I know what that look meant. Many a day, many a day, I remember one time striking out. He said to me, boy, you can't hit the broad side of a barn. <laughs> or another one, he would say, boy, you can't bat your way out of a wet paper bag <laughs> with holes in both ends. <laughs> you, know, you know what he was doing? He was shaping my thinking. Oh, my. So I get up there, and I guess I, I was like Belteshazzar, standing there, my knees knocking. And I got a hit. We kept the inning running. But you know, you know what? As, as I pondered, as I pondered this, this idea of, of baseball, men, the church, we, we are up, up at bat. And right now, in the culture, we're losing. Yeah, we're we're in fact, in fact, let me say this: Man of Bible is in decline. Just let that marinate. Let that marinate. Man of Bible is in decline. The vast majority of us in this room are over 45, which means this, in another 20 years, if we don't have a replacement in Manna Bible, in less than 10, 15 or so years, we'll have to close these doors. We're up at bat. We're, bases are loaded. And we're down three runs. And two outs, two outs, three balls and two strikes. What are we going to do? And, you know, you know, God wants to send men up to bed. Yeah. We, we've, been, we've been absent, men. We've been absent in, in many regards. Tomorrow we're gathering, men of manna. We're gathering tomorrow at 7 o'clock for prayer. And unfortunately, unfortunately, now if you have to work, we, we understand that. But unfortunately, there will be some men who will choose not to come. That, that will be a tremendous shame. We're calling the men of men to come and to pray. Why? Because we're up at bat. And, and because as in terms of the culture, from a human standpoint, we're losing it. We're losing it. We're, we're, not, we're not making enough headway into the culture. Look. In terms of in terms of baptism, our baptisms, our, our new new believers coming to Christ, the numbers are dropping. Why? Because men, we're, we're failing. We're failing to to be actively engaged in reaching the loss. This this is this is the call of God on our lives. And we have an opportunity now to keep the game going. And the way we're going to do it, we're going to assemble for prayer tomorrow night. And we're going to confess our sin. We're going to confess our laziness. We're going to confess our absence. We're going to confess our passivity. We're going to confess that which keeps us from being the leader that God wants us to be. And then the following week, I'm sorry, July 7th, we're going to be gathering on July 7th for the study called The Kingdom Man. We're 
inviting every man, and I trust every one of you got the letter we sent out, inviting you to be a part of the Kingdom Man Initiative. The whole idea is that we want to shape our minds, our thinking, our worldview, such that we realize that we're men of God who are kingdom men, that our reason for existing in this world is for the kingdom of God. And if this culture is going to change, it will be because of men. God didn't ask women to go fight wars. You can't read in scripture where you have women going, putting on armor, going to fight. God wants men to fight this. God wants men out in the community. God wants men engaging with young men. God wants you and I, you and I, step up to that plate. Sure, sure. Every one of us are scared. Sure, you and I, you and I ought to be, ought to be, ought to be. But we ought to trust God with our fear. Put it in his hands. God is able. Told Adam, I want you to tend it, to keep it. Make it produce. And, and hence, we're, we're responsible for looking at the condition of where we are. And going forward. And it is in my heart. I want to see. I want to see Manna Bible. Rise to its capability. That the potential. That he has created this garden for. That Manna Bible can live out. The, the true meaning. If I can borrow Martin Luther King's word. The true meaning. Of its name. Manna. That will be bread for this community. Amen. That will build bridges to the drug deals, we'll build bridges to the single parent, we'll build bridges to those who don't have jobs, we'll be, build bridges to those who are caught up in crime. And, and if, if men don't, if men don't, it won't get done. We cannot expect that women are going to make the difference in this community. It just won't happen. It hasn't happened because men have not been doing it. And I want to say this, beloved, and, and with all my heart, and I mean this in a genuine sense. I believe God can do this. I, I don't doubt God's ability. I don't doubt, don't question whether or not he wants it. I believe he has called us to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is our day. We're up at bat. This is our time. It is our moment. God has called us for this. I believe it with all my heart. But I'm also convinced of this, that men vote by way of their presence or the lack thereof. And so when men don't come, it's a, it's a vote of no confidence. And I, want, I wanna, want you to think, men. I want you to think. We, we cannot, we cannot risk, we cannot risk your absence. We need, we need every man on deck. Every one of us. Every one of us. And there are some. There are some who perhaps can't walk and go into the community with us. But you know what you can do? You can pray, beloved. You can pray. You can, you can back us up. You can come and encourage us. You can stand with us. And, and we, we just, we, we, we need men. We need men. It's a plea. I'm begging. Not ashamed of it. But for God's sake. For God's sake. The Bible says to whom much is given. Much is required. And if God through his grace sent his son to die for your sins. What do you owe him? I just think it's time to get up off the couch. I just think it's time to put the remote down. I just think it's time to come out and, and be counted and to show up. Wednesday night, we need more men. Security. We need more men. And thank God for the men who come here on Wednesday night. Faithful, faithful believers who come and who sit to make sure 
And, and thanks be to God that they're here. The, the, the couple of men that do come to, but, but beloved, beloved, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious and, and I'm throwing it out there. I'm just throwing it out there, but it's rhetorical. Why don't you come? What, what is it that keeps you from really going after God? What is it that really has your heart? The Lord God called, commanded Adam, put him in the garden, tend it, keep it, and commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Adam ate of the tree that he was forbidden to eat of. And frankly, I think sometimes what keeps men from tending the garden is that they're eating fruit from a tree that is off limits. That's, that's why men, we, we really do need to call men to repentance, to this place of praying, to this place of brokenness. And with that in mind, I want to um, stop here. But I do want to encourage you men, the Lord willing, I pray, I pray that every one of us will be here. In fact, um, when we sent the letters out, we have a hundred, over a hundred men here at Mano Bible. Over a hundred men. Young men, older men as well. But right now, do you think there are a hundred men in this room? See, systemically, I think there's something wrong in, in our church. And we're, we're going to, we, we've got to go after that. We've got to fix that. We, we've got to call it what it is. When Jesus looked at the seven churches of Asia Minor, he said to the Ephesus church, I know your works. I know you've done. I know, I know you've done a lot. But I, I've got this against you. And there are some things that we just need to clean up for God's sake. Father, in this hour, I pray that every man of God will hear the voice of the living God, the Savior. And I do pray, Father, that they'll sense their responsibility to you first, to the church of the living God, your bride. I pray, Father, that even now, that transformation would start in the hearts of the men of God. Praying for our gathering on tomorrow. I pray that you'll move on hearts, on minds, shaping minds, reshaping ideas. I'm praying for the kingdom man initiative that every man of manna will hear the appeal of the Savior.